record that. Okay, so let me back up. The question is, what will we need to report for third grade this year? Um, we will still do the third grade promotion retention report. It will be open this fall. We had to make some programming changes because it was designed to preload just the third grade students who did not meet RSA criteria on the state test. And when we didn't take a state test, that means all of our students will have to be on there, but it will still just be a click, go through how were students promoted. Um, so that should be open, I want to say September when they, uh, OMES said that they would be able to have those programming updates taken care of so that we could have access to that. That's a report that's not due until uh, October 31st. And of course, we'll grant as much um, flexibility with that as we possibly can. Uh, but we are reliant on that information to get a legislative report out by the end of the calendar year. So um, we will get that, but um, it'll basically be um, if Timmy was promoted, how was she promoted? And you'll click. She was either promoted through a screener. She was promoted through one of the seven exemptions, just clicking the exemption, or she was promoted by committee, or she was retained. And it's just a click for each person. So that's, if you have an idea of where those kids are. Um, and then we also asked OMS, they put in a column on that report of did not assess. And we will give specific um, instances of when that would be inappropriate because obviously we didn't assess, we were building it anyway. Um, but for students that maybe arrived right before the distance learning um, or where we've given you uh, permission to just say, we're just promoting them, we will have some pretty specific guidance for what that will look like this year. Okay, I've been away from the reading world for a few years. I'm trying to catch back up with what is going on. Oh my goodness, where have you been if you've been away from the reading world for a few years? Um, you know what, Bree? Uh, if you want to chat, um, why don't you just give me an email or a phone number or a, uh, and we'll just talk for a while um, because there's a lot going on in our reading world. Um, Claudia. What, what do you need repeated? You can unmute yourself, Claudia. Okay, <laughs> priest in teaching math, so. <laughs> oh, just when you said the report is due. The report for the third grade promotion retention, it won't be open until September because of the programming changes, but it's not due until the end of October. So we, we have time there, so. We will, you know, it's, it's fall and all fall is the busy time for RSA. So we'll just have all kinds of fun. All right, so the agenda, I'm going to share my screen so that we can see this as well. Um, is the link to the agenda is also posted in our chat box and we have Timmy and Brenda with us as always. We're so happy that they're with us. So Brenda, wave so everyone sees you. Uh, Brenda's our director of social studies with her Hamilton background. I'm sure, how many times have you seen Hamilton since it started streaming? I don't know, I can't, yeah, I can't hear you. <laughs> I, I just, what, just once on Friday night on the stream. Oh my goodness, that's it. I figured you'd have seen it at least 20 times by now. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Timmy Spangler has moved to a new position out of... Yes. Director of Instructional Materials. She is now the Project Director of the Striving Readers Grant. All right. So yeah. we have not gotten rid of her. No okay. more textbook adoptions. <laughs> so, and you should have seen our agenda on your screen right now. So um, we have, again, our RSA guidance that was last updated June 3rd. We've met a couple of times since then. There's really not anything new. This is wrapping up the 2019-20 school year. Um, so if you are new to our group, please make sure that you have a chance to check that out. This looks like this. Um, you, there's the direct link on the agenda, or you can go to the RSA coordinator page on the state website, and you'll see it in great big letters right there at the top. Okay, and it just gives some general guidance for the first couple of pages. We have a decision tree for those promotion retention decisions. Hopefully most of that is taken care of at this point. Um, and then a whole bunch of questions 
um, asking about the 2019-20 school year. So now I know our focus is shifting over to our 2020-2021 school year. Um, and we did recently have some administrative rules for RSA that were updated and signed by the governor just last week. So I wanted to take a moment. Um, you can find these again on the RSA legislative page. If you go to the state website, you'll see RSA legislation. And you'll find this under rules where it says updated RSA administrative rules right here so that you can refer to that. This is the um, copy of the rules that was submitted for approval. These have been approved. They haven't been filed um, yet as far as on the uh, state website where, that's, uh, where those updated rules are kept, but they will be very soon. Um, but these do go into effect for the 2021 school year. Um, so just so you'll know, if you see anything underlined, that's new language. If you see anything crossed out, that's old language that no longer applies. Uh, just so you, you have that um, awareness. So just real quick, because this is a lot uh, and we don't wanna have to go through every little bit of this. Um, I just went ahead and pulled up a real quick um, summary of those changes so that you're just aware of what's going on. Uh, because it's quite a bit. So remember the administrative rules um, are laws written by state agency. They are specifically authorized by legislation. The RSA statute does direct the um, uh, Oklahoma State Department of Education to write and adopt rules, administrative rules uh, for the Reading Sufficiency Act. And be before becoming effective, those rules are subject to a, a very stringent um, rulemaking process which means that we had to draft things, they had to go out for public comment, they went through review and approval by the legislature, and then had to be um, approved by the governor. Uh, some of the primary changes in these rules included a lot of updating and clarification of language. There was just some language that has become obsolete with different statutory changes. And so those rule language was uh, made to match that. Uh, remember that rules carry the weight of law. We can't ignore the rules. They have that same weight, but the rules can also not be in um, opposition of law. They have to support the law. They just really provide more detail. Uh, there were some definitions added to the rules that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, there was some clarification about reports and funding. One really important thing I want to make sure that we are all aware of. Uh, some scheduling for instruction and intervention clarity was provided and then kind of cleaning up some language about ongoing requirements for probationary promotion. So in language, uh, we've removed, made sure that the, the references to unsatisfactory or proficient on the state test were all removed. It now reads grade level criteria as established by the Office of Educational Quality and Accountability. That's code for RSA criteria on the state test. So when you see that phrase, it's just that they meet RSA criteria or they don't meet RSA criteria. Um, so we still get a lot of confusion if we have students that meet RSA criteria but score unsatisfactory, districts aren't sure what to do. With, for promotion retention decisions under the Reading Sufficiency Act, we're only looking at that RSA criteria column. It also, the language was uh, match updates to any exemptions made in previous legislation. Remember, we had those two exemptions that changed this last year. Uh, and so the rules were updated so that it's matching that same language. There were a couple of definitions added at the beginning of the rules. One is um, the individualized program of reading instruction. That's just another fancy name for what we've all come to know and love as the academic progress plan. Um, but there were people who commented that it was very confusing because they did not see academic progress plan in the rules or statute um, and were very confused by the term academic as opposed to reading. So. Uh, the individualized program of reading instruction has been defined um, and in there anytime you'll see it you'll see in parentheses also known as the academic progress plan. Personally I don't care what you call it in your district as long as we have a good plan for our kids to be able to succeed. Um, you can say either name to me I'll know what you're talking about. Um, and I will try to use the two interchangeably as well so that I'm um, 
matching what is on paper as well as what we have come to know and um, understand that document to be. It's also defining the READ initiative, which is the Reading Enhancement and Acceleration Development. The READ initiative is really just what the Reading Sufficiency Act is. The READ initiative was uh, developed to ensure that students are able to be successful by the end of third grade. Uh, again, defining on our reports and the rules, it just specified that the due date and put, made sure that we put it in rules uh, for the reading sufficiency plan is August 30th. Um, it clarifies that as part of that plan, all K through three, through three students shall receive at least 90 minutes of reading instruction. And it also clarified the due date for the beginning of year report as October 1st. That's nothing new. We have been doing that for quite some time. It's just making sure that it's clarified uh, that if people were questioning about due dates or about that 90 minute requirement for all students, it's right there where we can point to it. This is why we have that. This is the one thing, if you take a picture of any slide, please take a picture of this one real quick and go show it to your principals, superintendents, and anybody else that has anything to do with reports and funding. Uh, this is new language in the rules. It says, in order to be eligible for Reading Sufficiency Act funds, a school district must submit its district reading sufficiency plan to the OSDE by August 30th and must submit its beginning of year report uh, in need for the number of students in need of remediation by October 1st. Okay, that means get those two plans, the plan and the beginning of your report done and completed and certified on time. Um, a school district that has not submitted either of these documents by the applicable due dates will not be eligible to receive Reading Sufficiency Act funds for the school year. Here's why this is happening. Um, if I'm sure many of you are aware that our funding uh, has coming, been coming out later than we really want it to come out over the last couple of years. And the primary reason for that is we have really it's a handful really a couple dozen districts that we just could not get to do their reports and the way the funding is, com is computed is it has to take all of the information from every single district and divide that out into the total so we can't give some people their money and then give a few more people their money once they get things done we have to it's divided on a per student basis um, the intention of this is to ensure that we get those reports in, in a timely manner so that we can get your funds to you in a timely manner. Okay. Uh, for the vast majority of our districts, we do not foresee this being an issue. Um, and really, the it's just, a, like we said, just a small handful that was really holding that up for the rest of the state. And we wanted to find a way to uh, take care of that. Now, there is an appeal process for this. So for some reason, if you are um, not able to get one of those two reports in on time, and it's because of a technical issue with your student information system or with single sign-on, um, notify our office as soon as possible and we will work with you on that. Um, you know, obviously if the system is down or uh, systems aren't talking to one another, we're waiting on a help desk ticket with OMES to get taken care of. Um, that's something beyond your control and we will work with you on that to make sure that you're not penalized for something uh, like that. If there's a non-technical issue that is beyond your district's control, for example, um, like Weber's Falls had that massive flood at the end of the year a couple of years ago and just simply could not get um, access to a lot of their things to get things taken care of. Um, file an appeal with the Oklahoma State Board of Education. We will uh, make sure that you have that information of how to do that on our website prior to that you needing that and that appeal will be considered by the board within 45 days of receipt um, that way uh, there there is something there now uh, uh, it can it's going to be up to the state board as to what they will um, approve as that that was beyond your control or not okay uh, also in the rules, it's given a little bit more definition for our multi-tiered systems of support. This is towards the end of the rules of those of you that were looking. It defines tier one as our core instruction, tier two is supplemental instruction, and tier three is an intensive intervention. Again, everything we've already been saying uh, and practicing, it's just making sure that it's written down for our reference. 
For tier one or core instruction, it defines that it's research-based, provided to all students, and it is based on the cognitive science of how students learn to read. Uh, aligned with the Oklahoma academic standards and again is a minimum of 90 minutes of reading instruction. For tier two or that supplemental instruction, um, this is for those students that are struggling a little bit. Uh, it's direct research-based instruction based on that science of reading um, designed to supplement the core instruction and address any students reading skill deficits based on their specific student needs. Uh, reflects the appropriate intensity and or frequency. We know that anytime we're providing supplemental instruction or intervention, um, intensity has a lot to do with um, how we're de uh, delivering that to a student. So a larger group is less intense than a smaller group. Um, a more specialized teacher um, that has had specific training like a speech language pathologist in dealing with language skills is going to be more intense than a classroom teacher that has not had that specialized training. Um, groups, let's see, I said group size, uh, frequency, uh, how often something is done, five days is going to be more intensive than three days a week. Um, and then the time or the duration, um, 45 minutes is going to be more intensive than 10 minutes. Uh, so anytime you're having to um, increase or decrease um, an intervention based on how a student is doing, it's that intensity, some of those things to consider. So that intensity um, and frequency needs to be based off of what you're seeing with that student and obviously make those changes. And then the in intervention uh, says determined by the teacher responsible for tier one reading instruction, a reading specialist if available and principal. Obviously, if there is another interventionist involved that they would be a part of that conversation. The idea here is, is that as a classroom teacher, if I have a student receiving intervention, I am not just sending them out my door and when somebody asks how they're doing, say, well, I don't know, they go to Mrs. Jones. Um, I need to know what's happening with that student as well because it has to co complement our tier one instruction. Um, intervention doesn't happen in a bubble. It happens alongside what they're learning in the general education classroom. Okay, so we're making sure we're trying to emphasize that. For our tier three intensive intervention, these are students that are well below their peers. Um, this is supplemental direct, again, customized and intensive research-based instruction, again, based on the science of how students learn to read. Um, and it's designed to not only supplement that core instruction, but it's really uh, focused in on the student's skill deficits by targeting the area or areas of greatest need. Often our students in tier three are missing, are low in everything. And so it's focusing in on what's going to be those areas of need for our Big, uh, that's going to get the biggest bang for our buck. Um, if it's a third grader who is tier three and is still struggling with reading um, very, very basic level books, um, fluency is not, even though they're struggling with fluency, that's not their area of greatest need. Their area of greatest need is learning how to process sounds and decode. Again, reflecting the appropriate intensity and frequency and that intervention being determined. Uh, again, we don't want to leave the tier one classroom teacher out of that conversation. We need to have uh, them involved in understanding how that's going to work. And then finally, on the probationary promotion, there was a lot of language that needed to be cleaned up because the rules were still referring to ACE, uh, which uh, is a program that no longer exists. Um, so it is a reminder, and again, nothing that we haven't been saying for the last several years, that that team uh, needs to continue to review the student's reading performance and repeat the evaluation and recommendation process each academic year. And this continues until the student either demonstrates grade level reading proficiency on an approved screening instrument. So the OSTP in fourth grade or fifth grade doesn't uh, have anything to do with this. It's that screening instrument or they transition to another school. And statute defines that this is after fifth grade. So if you are in a district where elementary ends at fourth grade and they transition to another school in fifth grade, it's, they're still a part of that because the rules don't supersede statute. Um, but if really is if they're moving to um, another level of schooling um, after fifth grade, then uh, they move to a locally developed plan. If a student's been approved for probationary promotion transitions to another school, uh, we need to make sure that their individualized program of reading instruction or academic progress plan 
is provided to that school so they know where to pick up and what to do with that student. So I kind of moved through that just a little bit quickly because again, it's just a quick summary, but this, uh, those slides are available to you where it says summary of changes to rules on your agenda, as well as a direct link to those rules if you just need a little nighttime reading to read them for yourself. So I'm gonna hey, pause Melissa. for a moment and let's there see what questions. Um, Celeste asked a great question and I just didn't know if everybody saw it in the chat, is if they're contacted after the deadlines to fix something, are they going to be penalized? No, we will, you will not be penalized okay. for that. Then thank you. I'm glad you asked that question. Your require, your responsibility is to get it in initially, um, complete and certified. And then we do know we can't necessarily, because um, we, we have a smaller team that's reading plans this year, um, we might need to um, ask a school to go in and fix something, and we'll go from there. But no, you would not be penalized in that case. So, what other questions have been showing up that we need to address? Uh, is the reading, the 90 minute reading block uninterrupted still? The word uninterrupted was taken out. We are working on guidance for that. The um, idea is that uh, it, it's feasible to take a um, break there, but it should not be small sections all pieced together. So the guidance, uh, again, I'm, I've, I've got to be careful because I'm still trying to get final approval on this, um, but I, th I think the overall idea is the guidance of those, uh, if it is not uninterrupted, that there would not be a block smaller than like 30 minutes. Um, so that it might be um, 30 minutes in an hour or two 45 minute sections. Um, ideally, uh, most of what we see, uh, we would want to have a, a large chunk of time. But having 10 minutes here and 20 minutes here, we all know in reality, doesn't work out that well. Um, so we do want to make sure that we have that um, emphasis and time. But we're hoping that by um, uh, taking out that word that we're acknowledging some scheduling difficulties, um, but still making sure there's an emphasis of reading skills for those early learners. Okay, so the next one is, um, and, and I just scroll down because, oh, for students that choose to participate in virtual online only school this fall, are the time requirements still the same? So for virtual school, that gets really kind of interesting. Um, I would say that even in a classroom, when you have 90 minutes, remember that you have, um, and we will talk about some of this at the session and engage as well, um, but you have some time where you are delivering whole group instruction uh, or where a student is actively uh, getting new material. And then there's time for specialized instruction like in a small group and then time for distributed practice um, over skills that students are able to do independently and accu with accuracy. Um, so when you're looking at virtual, it would be, is there uh, sufficient material and opportunities for both learning uh, targeted practice and um, the, the independent practice that would equal to about 90 minutes. And I can tell you, I mean, I've, I've taught for many years, you're going to have uh, three kids in the same group and you give them the same amount of work and one will take five hours, one will take 90 minutes, and one will take nine minutes. Um, so um, thinking about what would be appropriate at the grade level that you have, if you're teaching first grade, what would be an amount of um, work over those three types of uh, work that would equal to 90 minutes, that's about what you're assigning. And knowing that some will take a little longer, some will take a little less, you can't control that, okay? Um, the idea is not so much of, did you do 80 minutes versus 90 minutes of more so of are you giving sufficient time to practice the numerous skills that are involved in that reading block that need to be addressed. And when you're doing anything with legislation, you have to give some kind of number rather than just say sufficient time. So that's kind of where that's coming from. But most of the um, research that you'll see, um, 90 minutes is an average considering K through five whereas the upper grades are looking at 60 and the recommendation from experts for 
uh, K through two is really 120 minutes. So just kind of keeping that, that somewhere that 90 comes from is an average. So the idea is making sure we have that sufficient time, that the minimum requirement for all those students is 90. All right, Melissa, we got, we got a roll of uh, questions here and I just got a text question. Do students that are promoted from third to fourth through good cause exemptions one, two, and six need intervention in fourth grade also? Any student promoted through exemptions must have uh, continued uh, ongoing interventions until they are on grade level, um, especially one, which would be our EL students. Video. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. Roxy. <laughs> Roxy got to make her appearance on the video. Sorry. Um, exemption That's what six. happens when you have a child in the house. Exemption six would be students who've been previously retained. Um, Likely, if they've had a previous retention and they're still not, not meeting RSA criteria, that's, that's really the ones we're most concerned about. Absolutely, they have got to get some additional instruction to make sure that they can be successful. So yes, any student that's promoted through an exemption or through um, the probationary promotion with the student reading proficiency team must continue to receive intervention uh, beyond third grade until they are reading on grade level. All right. There's a question about, um, people are adding more questions, so I have to go back to it. Is there a chance that Edmentum's exact path diagnostic test will become an approved RSA screener? Not for this year. Um, we <laughs> are looking at doing a review of screeners again because we are on a three-year cycle for doing that review. So we will conduct that review this year. Edmentum may choose to submit exact path for review, uh, just as any other company would. Uh, we will conduct that review, have the results to the board for approval this summer. For next year, for the 21-22 school year, that way districts can, uh, during that school year, look at the options, um, make any changes they wish to make and provide training, but a new approved list would go into effect for the 22-23 school year. So we're two years out from that. That allows um, uh, sufficient time for us to conduct the review the way we need to and gives districts opportunities to really see what's there and provide training before having to implement something. So um, at this point, there is uh, not because we, we, we go through a very, um, regimented process for reviewing those screeners. Um, and so having a, a company just say, well, we want to add on uh, that, that would create issues because we'd have that opens up the floodgates for everybody else as well, so. But Melissa, there's another question about screeners. So some of our families have requested an entirely online program for the next school year. Can we use two different screener assessments, one for the in-class students and one for the totally online students? Um, that, that one I need to investigate a little bit further. Um, and, and here's why is because um, there's a little bit of some differentiation between how those come out and I wanna make sure that we are um, having this much consistent data as possible. So that's a great question for me to get back with you on, so. Now you guys are getting into guidance for next year. I told you I'm not ready um, for it yet. <laughs> there, are, there is a bunch of questions that is really, they're really pertaining to that 90 minute reading block. Okay. So, well, Address those real quick. So what about, can students be pulled for small group intervention during the guided reading classroom time? Okay. So the uh, 90 minutes, the core instruction is protected for core level instruction. Um, there's some nuances in there that, again, that's that guidance that we're just trying to make sure is um, clear, but I'm gonna say is a quick answer, no. Um, there might be a small exception in a very, very defined um, situation, 
but for right now, let's go with no. And then if we get that defined situation, we'll have that um, in writing for you to be able to point to and refer to. Next question with that 90 minute, can reading remedial teachers pull the students during this 90 minute reading block? Or do the students have to be pulled at a different time like from math or social studies science block? Same, same answer that 90 minutes is protected under statutory requirements. Um, and the purpose of that 90 minutes is that we need to have our students exposed to on grade level instruction. Uh, so, you know, if, if I'm teaching third grade and I have a student that's needing intervention at a kinder or first grade level with accommodations and modifications, they still need to be exposed to third grade materials. That's what they're in third grade. They need to have um, the opportunity to experience third grade language, third grade comprehension skills. Um, and, you know, so it might be they're doing a lot of things orally and then during their pullout at another time. They're doing that so that's why most schools have a protected intervention time or enrichment time so that they're not having to miss core instruction and other contents we certainly don't want them pulled from recess if you want to talk about a, a kid that just plain refuses to learn at that point that's that's not a great idea um, but that usually is how most schools when we look at a multi-tiered systems of support structure have a protected time of usually about 30 minutes to say this is when students are, are getting, maybe it's, it's a grade level uh, so that we can switch kids around. Um, but again, we're, we're trying to get some pretty explicit written guidance for you to be able to point to in that case too, so. Where is this? And, you're showing? I think the last one I see on that. Um, I'm a reading specialist for K2, no, it's, it just went, there was another one added, sorry. Um, are spelling, phonics, and read-alouds included in the 90-minute block? Absolutely, they are. Um, you, you cannot, um, re read-alouds are, are a great way of exposing students to vocabulary, background knowledge, and comprehension skills, especially if you're thinking aloud through some of those things. Um, spelling has so much to do. Decoding and encoding, which is spelling, uh, are a reciprocal process. Uh, when our students can't um, spell correctly, they're not going to be able to write and it's going to inhibit their ability to read. Um, so yes, yes, that's all included in there. And Kelly, I just put the link to the agenda again. Okay, I, it looks like, and I'm, I think what the question here is, uh, and Christy Greenfield may want to um, add more to it. She just says, uh, literacy first to screen students for intervention, which is very time consuming for them. Does someone recommend a more efficient screener? Um, and that is not an approved screener for RSA any longer, correct? That's correct. So literacy first um, is what's called a diagnostic or an informal diagnostic assessment. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to make sure that we had a very defined process for identifying screening assessments. So recall that screening assessments are meant to be very short and brief um, assessments that identify if a student is at risk or not at risk. An informal diagnostic, not to be confused with what a school psychometrist might use, but an informal diagnostic, which is what a teacher could use to say, um, these are the specific skills where that at-risk student is struggling um, and that we need to provide some help with. So literacy first is one example of uh, one of those diagnostics that we might run into and there's multiple out there. So, but you're right, and that's one of the reasons is if we start with a diagnostic for every student, it's extremely time consuming. Um, and while it's nice to have data, sometimes we simply don't need that data to get started with instruction. Um, and so we want to reserve that time for diagnostic students that are really struggling and we just don't know where to start. And so that helps us pinpoint where to start. And there's a ne the new question, uh, how about intervention time? Can intervention time be included in the 90 minute block or is this 90 minute block just for core? 90 minutes is for our core tier one instruction. Intervention is on top of that. So intervention should not supplant our core instruction they need those students need more so so I would, I'm going to say with this and I did get one more question just privately that I want to um, address this too is if a student is tier three and on an IEP 
um, do they have to get their intervention pull out from the SPED resource teacher or reading specialist? The who provides the intervention is up to you as a district based off of your resources. Uh, we will have students in tier three who have an IEP and it would make sense that their interventionist would be a special education resource teacher. We also have students on tier three that do not have an IEP or do not qualify for IDEA services. Um, so again, it's, it's dependent on the case, the needs of that student and who's qualified to give them. You know, you might have a student in tier three who's uh, needing speech language pathologist services because of a language delay that would be included in their intervention time because language delays have a massive effect on reading ability. So, um, so Melissa, again, there was one question way up at the top that I didn't want to forget about a clarification about do they have to do APPs for kindergarten students? Okay, so that was a change in Senate Bill 601 that was passed in the spring of 2018 uh, that went into effect last year. Um, so for kindergarten students, we will still screen them at the beginning of the year. We will still include them on our child count for beginning of year. But for the fall semester, for students who are in kindergarten who are below that grade level target, districts may choose to just target instruction for them and see if they can get that core instruction to where they need to be. By the middle of year, a screening assessment that kindergarten students would do if they are not meeting grade level targets, then it would be required that they have that reading plan written for them at that time. So that gives schools and, and those students uh, the fall semester to see if formalized schooling, because for sometimes that's the first time they've been exposed to that, will get them at those grade level targets because some kids pick it up real quickly. We've had a lot of kindergarten teachers tell us that they have a ton of kids that show up at the beginning of the year and by middle of year it really evens out and the ones they really at that point are saying are the ones truly that are probably needing some help. So no, at the beginning of the year, a plan is not required for kindergarten students, but it is required by the middle of year um, for those students. And that's, that went into effect this last year. I know uh, it's always hard to remember kind of what we did that, Last, last fall seems like a very, very long time ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, so um, we are gonna save this chat and I know there's some questions we probably haven't gotten to, but I also wanna make sure we have a chance to move forward because we only have about 20 minutes left of our time. Um, and then if we have more time, we'll come back to a few more of those. I wanted to make sure you were also aware that on the running agenda, which I put the link in the chat uh, one more time, and I'm going to put it here at the end so that you have it. Oops, I need it to the, everybody. Um, maybe I'll put it there. Uh, we have updated um, a, a form that can be used for that um, in individualized program of reading instruction or academic progress plan. And there's two forms. Again, I'm going to show you. It's on the... RSA coordinator page on the OSDE website and you will find it if you scroll down under sample documents, the individualized program of reading instruction also known as the academic progress plan. The name is defined in the administrative rules update. There are two links here. One is to a printable PDF and one is to a fillable PDF. So you'll see the printable PDF where you can print this and have a paper copy and fill this out or you will have a fillable PDF so that you can just fill it out online and save it electronically, okay? Uh, this is a lot of that same information that has always been included. A couple of things we did update. Um, we've had a lot of requests for having a way to record fourth and fifth grade students that might still need that assistance. So we've got a way to indicate if they are in fourth or fifth grade. And then we just added this student status right here at the top. Um, it's either the first time that they've had uh, any kind of, needed any kind of assistance since they've been, been enrolled in public school. And um, this kind of gives us a good idea of kind of where kids are. Um, or they've previously had uh, uh, a plan, but then they've met the grade level target and were removed. Because we always have those kids that they get on a plan at the beginning of first grade and by the end of first grade, 
oh, they're doing great, they're meeting grade level targets, we take them off. Second grade comes, they're back on a plan. And so it kind of gives us an idea of what's going on with that pattern. Um, and, and maybe we need to uh, be a little more careful about taking some of those kids off if we're seeing repeated things or what's going on, what's happening over the summer or um, things like that, why they keep coming back on and off. Um, they've been on a plan, let's say they've been on that plan since middle of kindergarten and it's now second grade and they're still on that plan, they've never come off, that's a huge red flag. We probably need to move forward with something more intensive, what is going on. Um, that might be a candidate for special education. It might not. It might be that there's some other things going on that we need to investigate a little further, such as attendance. Have they been showing up? Um, or it, are they in seven different schools every year and they are just missing a lot of things? But something there um, is, again, a red flag. Or are they that fourth or fifth grade student um, that they just haven't met those grade level targets? So again, all of the information that is required in statute, we can click on right here. Uh, a lot of this you'll recognize from our previous forms we've had. It's just that rather than having separate forms for every grade level, it was easier just to combine that into one, okay? Um, we do have a place on here for noting if they've met that screening target and were eligible for promotion through that pathway too that we've discussed earlier. Um, the fillable form would also be able to uh, allow for if a conference is held virtually. If we are in a situation like we were in this last spring where we really can't have parents coming in um, uh, uh, in person, uh, we could have somebody attest that uh, these people that are named here were here and that this is what was agreed on so that that way um, we can prevent that piece of paper having to be moved around a lot. Then I want to take, while I've got you here too, and take a moment and make sure that we are aware of that annual district reading plan. It is currently open. Uh, you can find that on our website by going to the resources to single sign-on. Um, this again is for those people that have to uh, complete some kind of report. So if you are a classroom teacher, you may not have to deal with this part, but if you're an administrator or that administrator's designee, uh, you're up. It's time for you to have fun with this. So, uh, Melissa, I, I think that I've, there's a lot of comments. I think that the timeline on that has not been updated, even though it's opened, like on the district timeline section. Well, I mean, on the on the single sign-on, because I yes. have that are able to access it. Yeah, so, but the pre-filled dates are, I think, last year's no, maybe? I, I've already checked them. They're, they're there. They're okay. on there. So I've, that's one of the things I went up last week and double-checked. Um, so, yes, these, this is open. This is accessible. We have districts that have already started drafting in this. So um, there is a tutorial uh, that was sent out on our newsletter, and uh, OMAS is getting it put on single sign-on. Uh, this is just to be aware that there's some important information as you're getting started. You have to open up that district plan before you can access the site plans. Um, user roles are very important when it comes to the reading plan. There are four different types of user roles. There's the district superintendent and a district user, and then there's the principal and the school user. Um, according to the role which you're assigned, uh, you have rights to do certain things or not do certain things. So um, if you're not sure why you can't see something, it might be because of the role that you have. So please be sure to make sure you go back and watch this tutorial. We've explained uh, what roles can do what. Um, the district superintendent is the one who assigns roles for your districts. I've got something that we are not able to do at the state level or for OMES, that would have to be through your superintendent. All site plans have to be confirmed before the district plan can be certified. So if you are in a district that has multiple elementary sites, let's say you have five elementary sites, all five sites have to do what they're supposed to do and be confirmed before the superintendent's able to certify that plan. And remember that certified the whole district plan is what's required by August 30th, okay? So I know there has been some concern of what if there's one school that doesn't do what they're needing to do. Um, that superintendent or their designee needs to be able to make sure that the principal is well aware of what they're costing the district um, if they are not getting that taken care of. Um, just as a 
Another quick reminder too, when you first open that plan um, at the district level for superintendents or district users, there are three questions that have to be answered. Um, and it starts with, were all previous plans approved? The answer there is yes. There aren't any plans that we have not previously approved. Um, but it also will ask, did 100% of students meet RSA criteria? Everybody will answer no, because that means that no one took the OSTP to meet RSA criteria. So everyone will have to answer no for that second question. And then are any of your schools, um, really it says, are they exempt from CSI or TSI status? Are they being served by the Office of School Support or not? Okay, this just kind of gives, um, Usually in the past, we've had a handful of districts exempt from the requirements if they're able to answer yes to all of those questions. This year, no one will be able to be exempt because of that second question. Okay. Um, and as you go in, you'll uh, let's see, there's our district plan. You only can see the district plan if you are a superintendent or a district user role. Uh, and then we have our site plan, if I come across to here, you'll see where our site plan and all of those areas that have to be filled in. Again, on the tutorial, we've gone through each section um, and told you kind of really what we're looking for. Just to avoid getting that call from us saying, please fix something, uh, just watch that tutorial. It's only 30 minutes. It'll save you a ton of time, I promise. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, that is probably the biggest thing uh, is just making sure that we're very aware of that reading plan. Uh, finally, we have Engage in the Cloud next week and you could fill every single slot with the reading selection if you would like. Um, I know the first thing Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, um, I'm going to be talking about early reading instruction with RSA and Science of Reading. So some of those questions that were coming up today we'll probably be addressing um, as well next week. Uh, and then the afternoon, Michelle DeBerry, and I'm going to be helping her, we'll be doing a section on dyslexia at one o'clock. Um, this is not just for special education, it is for all teachers. So uh, if you ha are hearing about the uh, different legislation that's been happening with dyslexia and what we're going to be doing, as well as the fact that we just have a lot of students um, struggling with word recognition um, skills in our classrooms, uh, whether they have a label or not, that would be a, uh, a very helpful session for you. And then Thursday morning, we'll talk about effective literacy in early childhood. And then that afternoon, uh, looking at the Oklahoma Academic Standards for English Language Arts. They are up for review this year. This is an opportunity to provide feedback on those standards that will be considered uh, by the teams of teachers that are working on any revisions to the ELA standards. Uh, so if you are involved in reading in any way whatsoever, I would strongly recommend making sure that your voice is heard um, because this is your, your chance to do that. And then Friday morning, uh, Deb Wade, our um, elementary ELA director, will be talking about effective literacy in the intermediate grades. If you have not yet enrolled for Engage, the link to register is right there. It is free. You will receive a, a Zoom code to be able to watch those. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you at that time. So. Okay, so we've got just a few minutes left. So let's come back to any questions. Um, I'm seeing a couple engaged sessions will be recorded. You will be able to access them. I know that's been a concern if somebody has two that they wanna to go to. For example, um, at the same time I'm presenting, Brenda's doing a fabulous presentation on the Tulsa Race Massacre that uh, I know is probably geared more towards secondary, but I know I plan on watching it just because I think that there will be a lot to learn there, especially given um, information going out today. So um, they, they will be accessible and just make sure that you are uh, registered and they will be on the website eventually too. It might take them a little while to get the accessibility features uh, taken care of. Is there going to be a video available on dyslexia to train our teachers this fall? Yes, yes they, there is and I know that's one of the things Michelle has been uh, working very hard on. Uh, there was a team that we worked together to create. It's about a 30 minute um, interactive video. It will be on Pepper and it will also be on the OK Edge platform. 
um, and she will be talking about how you can access that. It will fulfill the requirements for House Bill 1228 that goes into effect this year that says that all of our certified teachers, pre-K through 12, would have training on dyslexia awareness. Um, it is really just a high level um, overview. Uh, and again, that's, that's all that's required right now, just to get an idea of what is dyslexia and what is it not, because we have a lot of myths running around. Um, it's not meant to say, uh, to watch that and be, be able to go diagnose people with dyslexia because that, that's not what we're equipped to do uh, right now, but that's meant to say, let's all at least get on the same page and make sure we're talking about the same vocabulary. So, uh, let's see. What else? Timmy and Brenda, what else do we need to deal with? There, there was another question about, um, Kindergarten. So wanting to clarify, so we still screen kindergartners at the beginning of school, but they aren't placed on a plan until the middle of the year. How do we add them to our account for funding if we don't have them on a plan until after the deadline? Okay, so for every grade level, there's a grade level target. And if they are below that grade level target at the beginning of year, you will include them on your child count. Um, you as a district may choose to go ahead and write a plan. If you want to start writing your, uh, a plan for your beginning kindergartners, that's a choice that you may do. Uh, you're just not required to. Um, but what you're saying on that child count is these are the number of students that we've identified through a screener that are at risk for reading difficulties. Um, it's not that these are the number of students on a plan. So we can do that off of the screener number when you're looking at that. And if you're not sure of what that grade level target is you can let me see go back to our home page on the rsa website with coordinators you'll see technical guidance for our approved screening instruments right here so i can click on let's say my screener is a cadence And you'll see the grade level target for the beginning of your kindergarten is 26 off of their um, uh, composite score. So if they're below 26, you will include them on your child count. If they're 26 or above, then they're good to go. Okay. So, and I am, uh, wait, I've given uh, these vendors until August 1st to get me any updates to norms that they might have. I've heard of a couple of our vendors that have updated their norms charts. Uh, so, these, uh, I, I will, of course, up, um, when we have our uh, September meeting and also in our uh, newsletter, we'll make sure that we are making you aware of any changes that might have occurred uh, if vendors send those in. So, but that's where you can find that information. Okay, what else? There, there are several questions about guidelines for screening students who opt to do online school next year. Okay, and I'm not able to answer those right now. Okay. Can an uh, English language teacher pull EL students during the 90 minute reading block? We cannot pull students during the 90 minute block. Period. Um, they can work, that's that with an EL teacher, it's certainly providing intervention, but it is in addition to what's happening in the 90 minute block. Um, they can push in and they can offer support during that time. Um, but if that's considered, that's cannot be considered their intervention time. <laughs> Melissa, there was a question for asking you to repeat the dyslexic training requirement again. So I'm sorry, my dog is barking. Oh, you're fine. So with dyslexia under House Bill 1228, um, starting this year, all certified teachers, uh, pre-K through 12, uh, need to receive a dyslexia awareness training. And so uh, the State Department has developed a uh, interactive video that can be used to fulfill that requirement. Um, it could be that uh, a district decides to work with somebody else to do that. You might have somebody on staff who's very knowledgeable about dyslexia, you might even want to um, 
use the Oklahoma Dyslexia Handbook that's located online, uh, both on the RSA page and the special education page, and uh, spend some time going through this, even doing a scavenger hunt through this handbook. Um, those are all ways that we can talk about dyslexia awareness, being aware of what it is, what it is not, and uh, ways that we can address the needs of those students in our classroom, especially in the K through three grades, um, where we are really with dyslexia, remember that it is a, a neurological disorder addressing sounds and the ability to process those sounds and connect them to letters. That's what we teach in our early reading grades. And so uh, making sure that we are providing an explicit and systemic instruction um, in, in that way and, and recognizing what to look for can be very helpful of uh, preventing long-term issues later on for those students. Melissa, did, where will that uh, video be located when it is available? On either the Pepper platform with special education or the OK Edge platform, the online uh, professional development. You can go on our state website and just search in for OK Edge and should be able to find that as well. But we will also, I will, um, once I hear that too, we'll also probably link it on the RSA page so it's a little easier to find. Um, I have one other question. Uh, can they remake the APP form or the individualized, because I can't remember the new yeah, no, I, I gotcha. APP I gotcha. to me. <laughs> can we so, can a district go ahead and remake their own? There is nothing wrong with that, but you do need to make sure that all of the statutory requirements um, are there. Uh, so, you know, it, it requires um, that we have things in here, like for example, um, it's, it's in statute that we have to list uh, the conjoint measurement model. Uh, you can't leave, if you do something on your own or you edit this and you take that off, then you are no longer meeting statutory requirements. And um, from my understanding, the RAOs, when they come to visit, uh, are looking for things like that on, the, on, the, uh, on that form. And so that's, that usually asks me for a list of what to look for, and those are the things I'm pointing out to them. So uh, do be very cautious if you make adjustments um, that you are making sure that you have everything on there that you need to have. Another question, do K kids in K through three take the STAR early literacy or can the older kids do STAR reading? Older uh, so the way Renaissance has uh, talked about with the early literacy versus reading is they have recommended that when a student is able to start reading connected text or get to a, a level on early literacy that they are uh, showing that they're ready for that reading, uh, that they should move to reading. Uh, now we have several districts that have said at this grade level they will move to reading. You cannot meet um, the grade level target for reading uh, with STAR by using the early literacy test in third grade. You have to be at the STAR reading by third grade um, because remember the early literacy is really talking about really K-1 skills. Uh, so if they're still on STAR early literacy in second grade, that's a little bit of a red flag. By third grade, it's really just they're well below where they need to be if they're still needing that early literacy assessment. Okay. Where can we find the statutory requirements for the APP? Okay, on the, back to the um, RSA coordinator page, you'll come back here to RSA legislation. And these are all of the statutes around RSA. So you will really, the most of them are here at 508C. Okay. This is the uh, legislative requirements for RSA right here. <laughs> it's a little bit of reading to do uh, in very small print, but they are embedded in here. Uh, they are not all in one place, which always makes it fun because the way legislation is written. So there's parts here and parts there. So you really have to look at the whole thing and um, really just highlight what you're looking for in there. That's one of the reasons it takes us so long to get some things out is we're having to go through all of that as well as the rules and triple check everything to make sure that we've got everything on there. 
Okay, it is three o'clock. Are there is there anything else here that um, is just a burning like it? We have got to get this answered today, or um, is most other things that we can address in follow up. Okay, it sounds like most of it's gonna be in follow-up. So if we did not get to your particular question and you really need the answer within the next 24, 48 hours, please shoot me an email so that we can get that taken care of for you. Otherwise, we will work on getting answers to these questions. And I realize that the question about how we're going to deal with screening and these requirements in a virtual environment is very pressing and we're trying to get that out for you just as quickly as we can. Um, but I also do not wanna speak out of turn and uh, provide advice for you that I find out later on is not, uh, not viable. So uh, we, we will get that for you and thank you for your patience on that. So anything else for the good of the whole? You do have the ability to unmute yourself if you need to yell one more time. Melissa, that was just a clarification. So star reading as well as star early literacy are both approved for RSA? Yes, so the umbrella term is star early learning. That's what Renaissance submitted and that includes early literacy and reading as a working together. So both of those are included. I know that gets confusing. That's not a name we made up, so I'm not gonna take any ownership on that one. Um, but early literacy for our youngers and then the read, they should be transitioning to reading uh, prior to third grade once they're getting that connected text. Okay, I see. A few Lisa, since this had a lot of new information with the rules, is this going to be recorded for them? Or yes. some, some had technical difficulties, that's why I was asking. Yes, we did record this. Um, I will request that this be put on the YouTube channel and send this out so that you will be able to have access to this, as well as everything that we've looked at has links on the um, agenda so that you don't have to go through and search for it. Uh, it's all right there for you. So, and thanks Brenda for posting the link to the agenda again. If you're typing in that link in a search bar, please realize that Bitly uh, web addresses are case sensitive. Uh, I know I've run into that before where someone said it didn't work it's because it's case sensitive. You have to capitalize that RSA in there. Okay, I see several people logging off. I think Timmy and Brenda will just stick around for a few minutes as people are logging off and seeing if there's anything else that comes up. Melissa? Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm in a K through two, and um, I was wondering if on the site plan I could put different interventions, depending, because I'll be using different interventions for different grades. Yes, yes, and it's designed for that. The garden here's what we do. We'll be doing three. So just for the grades that you uh, do work with. Thank you. If you get in there and run into problems, give us a holler. Any one of us will be able to help you with that. Okay, anything else? Well, I hope to see most everybody, if not all of you at um, Engage. I know I haven't checked my enrollment lately, but I know it's been getting up there. No, oh, it's, it's only, well, we've got lots of room. We've only got 173 people enrolled for RSA session next week. I think they cap at 500. So we've got lots of room. So everyone bring your friends and come join us. <laughs> um, oh, Leanne, that's a great question. I don't know if Leanne's still on here or not. No, I don't think she is. Well, I guess we'll address that one. Yes, yes. I'm on. Okay. Yeah, as far as reporting uh, that where they requested it instead of um, RSA related. Hmm. I think my, what I'm, I'm going to say off the top of my head, but I'm going to confirm this and we'll put it in writing for you, um, is that we would still 
put on the third grade promotion retention report that they were retained because they were that's just a factual you know there's going to be times where we're going to retain students that they would not have um, uh, necessarily uh, been under RSA in any given year and there's just really no way to uh, to separate this and, and we, we know that uh, we know this is just going to be one of those really weird years that we're going to have to really take that into account so when it comes down to that third grade promotion retention report regardless of why they were retained they were still retained and so we would just mark retained gotcha thank you sure thing all right I'm going to, I can stop sharing.